Good evening to you all in Europe. Uh, good morning and good afternoon for those of you tuning in from further afield. Uh, drop your flags and give your country a shout out um, in the comments below. It'd be great to see who is out there this evening. I'm Andy. I've uh, worked. and founder of the uh, uh, then you also got some like stash or Hi Andy, how are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully this is going to work. If not, if not, we'll uh, yeah, we'll keep going. So, um, I think a great place to start would be why you do what you do with with regards to the cars you build and kind of your ethos and stuff behind it. Can you uh, give us a few words? Yeah. Um, why do I do what I do? I don't know. Um, it's the same reason that everybody else does. Um, I I have a I have a huge passion for cars. Um, uh, first and foremost, I enjoy driving more than anything. Um, and I think the reason for that is just because it's, uh, it, it's, it's for the thrill of it, um, for making memories and getting to, to hang out with fellow petrol heads. So, um, yeah, I think my motivations are twofold. It's, it's the people behind the brand um, and, uh, and the cars themselves. Cool, cool. Um, what was your first experience with the Porsche brand? I've heard a story about a car chase or something when you were younger. <laughs> yeah, so that's a story that I, um, I've told a few times. So you'll have to forgive me, those of you that may have heard it before. Um, but essentially, my, uh, my dad had a 1983 um, Targa uh, 911, um, which would have been a 915 gearbox. And uh, anyway, and um, my mom eventually took me to kindergarten in that car. Uh, one time when she was picking me up from school, there were two guys in banaclavas that ran across the street in front of her. So she uh, slammed on the anchors to stop running them over. Um, and they jumped into a, um, into a station wagon and sped off. Uh, the result of which was, uh, well, she decided that she would speed off after them to try and, try and find out what was going on. So she, uh, she turned into Colombo. I was in the passenger seat. Um, she thought it was a, I don't know, a bank robbery or something of the sort. So we chased after them for what felt like 15 minutes, which was probably only about five. Um, and then eventually she let them get away, but not without me remembering the number plate. Uh, sure enough, the next day the police showed up. Um, or the, I don't know whether it was the next day, but uh, a little while later the police showed up. And indeed it had been involved in, uh, I think it was a jewelry store robbery. Um, and they found the car burnt and crisp, but um, hadn't found the culprits. Um, so for me, that was that was kind of a, a pivotal moment um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to my love affair with Porsches. Um, it was the sound of the air-cooled engine uh, uh, bouncing off the walls uh, uh, of the of the buildings as I was uh, being torn around London uh, in the in uh, in the 911. Um, so it suddenly gave me um, yeah, it suddenly gave me the bug, and it was a great story to tell at kindergarten the next day. Um, so yeah, it was baptism of fire. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a crazy story, and it's it's funny. It's been written about a few times, and uh, luckily I always ask for copy because uh, there are a few journalists have elaborated on it uh, a few times and, and gone a little bit too far. But yeah, it's uh, it's a good story that one. Yeah, it made out that you were the bank robber or something like that. No, I, I think it was it was I think it was Dan Fur from GT Porsche, um, or he'll he'll kill me if it wasn't him. But I can't remember <laughs> who it was. But there was some journalist who had somehow 
they, 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 when they'd written the story up, they'd involved, they'd, they'd thrown bazookas in there or something crazy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that, 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 that really would have pushed it into extra, extraordinary, um, which it certainly doesn't need, doesn't need to be because it already is an extraordinary story. But yeah, that's my, uh, that's my, that was, that was one of the seminal moments for me when it comes to um, my love affair with Porsches, yeah. And then got you hooked. So apart mm. from being surrounded by beautiful countryside there with your, with your lake and stuff, could you explain a little bit more about Box and Gas, what it is and what you've got planned for the future? Sure. Um, so Box and Gas is a, um, a destination for everything Porsche, or at least that's the idea. Um, the idea came about about five years ago. Um, and then we started looking for a site. A uh, few places fell through. And then finally, we settled upon the site for which Box and Gas is now. Um, it is a 100-acre business park, essentially, uh, dedicated to everything Porsche. So we have um, been building buildings for the last three years. We've probably got another three years of buildings ahead of ourselves. So far, I've built um, a little over 18,000 square feet, which is now inhabited by uh, probably the oldest established Porsche specialist in the country um, and may well be one in, the world, in, in Europe, forgive me. Um, which is also fun. They've been around since 1973, um, and uh, and then the rest of the buildings are all all the the, the final units. Um, there are three. Um, two of them are inhabited by Old Farm, and one of them is inhabited by me and uh, my personal uh, Porsche addiction. In terms of what else we do here, we we do events. Um, we'll be doing more and more of those as time goes by. Um, you would have may have heard it through my interview with uh, Petrolicious a couple of weeks ago that we'll be hosting there. Uh, drivers meeting here later this year if everything oh. according to plan with COVID-19 and we're also going to be hosting our own event which is all cool which is a classic Porsche event although it is open to all Porsches including the water-cooled variety um, of which believe it or not I have owned <laughs> as much as I get pigeonholed as an air-cooled guy um, and then what else in terms of the future well we've got another 30,000 square feet of uh, buildings that I'm developing um, but it'll be finished in, in several different stages um, and they will offer more Porsche related services um, as well as more hospitality elements. I would love to scream from the rooftops exactly what those services and that hospitality is going to be. Um, but unfortunately, the nature of the beast means that it is commercially sensitive and it wouldn't be respectful of the brands which will be coming aboard in the next few years um, to, to reveal all right now. But uh, yeah, essentially Box and Gas is is, is kind of a is kind of a melting pot for industry for the Porsche industry professionals and uh, the enthusiasts like myself and um, and that I've been around for a long time. It's it's hopefully a place that that, that people can can come and enjoy uh, their own little uh, their own little um, I don't know slice of Porsche paradise maybe. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, so for those just joining us, we're joined with uh, by Frank Cassidy this evening um, from Box and Gas. And it's probably uh, you mentioned your Porsche addiction. Do you want to um, give us a quick, uh, quick peek at what you've got downstairs? Sure. Don't just peek. Yeah. So, oh, actually, I'll show you while I'm here. Um, this is this is my office, um, essentially. Um, and what we deal with here is the events, um, the uh, the merchandise, um, and uh, the building of the building of Box and Gas. On a day to day, it is just me. I'm a bit of a one-man army, if, if there is such a thing. But, um, but otherwise, we have all our meetings here. So here is some of the design work that's going into the buildings. I'm just choosing materials, this and the other. Um, there's not much going on, actually, at the moment, because obviously with everything that's going on with COVID-19. But essentially, these are just some of the a glimpse into the, the, the more um, interesting side of what goes on behind the scenes when it comes to, to building the buildings. Um, but anyway... This unit um, was an old grain store amongst with all the other units, which I've finished to date, and they've all been fully refurbished. Um, nothing remains apart from the concrete rafters that you have here. Everything is, is industrial. Everything is, um, is left kind of uh, exposed. Um, yeah, just things true to the kind of Porsche heritage. It's more of a vintage feel, um, and it's our own identity. Um, yeah, and then down here is my personal Porsche addiction or Porsche, Porsche obsession. Um, this is 15 odd years of buying, selling, um, restoring, hot rodding, uh, leaving well alone, all of the above. There's a lot of mongrels here, Frankensteins, Bitsers, if you will, as well as um, highly original cars. Um, there's a real variety of, of, of yeah, different ways to, um, 
to skin a cat. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when we came up at the beginning of the year, obviously we were talking about sponsoring the oil cooled event. We'll kind of move on to that in a bit. Um, mm -hmm. You were building the, the white uh, race car, and you've got a Texan flag on the on the roof. How long did, were you in the US for? Yeah, so I was born in Cameron, Texas. Um, I was there for about a week and a half. Okay. Was, yeah, my mother was half Mexican. My father was half Dutch. Um, sorry, my mother was Mexican. My father was Dutch, so I'm half Mexican, half Dutch. Then I was adopted at birth by two French parents before I was even born. So I was there about a week, and then I came straight over to the UK. So I've been, to the, I've been in the UK all my life, pretty much. Um, so, so really, the flag is kind of a part of where I was born. I'm a Texan, I guess, in some way, shape, or form. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just a memory of, of, of that, I guess, in some way. But yeah, I'm what you call a mongrel. Um, yeah, a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a mongrel in the same way that a lot of my cars are mongrels. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if we um, if we go on to oil cooled, um, I had the pleasure of coming up uh, last year in my 944. Mm -hmm. uh, so questions really, can you kind of give us a bit of a summary on that one? And also, how are you feeling about it going ahead in August? Obviously, given the last last few months' events. Sure. So Orcord is a classic Porsche uh, event. Um, it's held here on the 100 acres that we have of Boxing Gas. Um, we have a, a really uh, gorgeous lake where we line a load of rare and historic cars. Um, and it's basically a very relaxed um, uh, kind of atmosphere um, for, 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 for guys who are, for people who are, who are into Porsches. The formula is very, very simple. It's um, all about great cars, uh, great people, great music, and great food. Um, those are our vital four ingredients. Um, and the rest of it is just a chilled out attitude. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, no, um, there's no VIP areas, there's no, um, there's, there's no exclusivity. It's all about inclusivity. And in fact, even though it is a classic Porsche event, there are um, water cool tickets available as well. Um, I don't know what else to say. This year we've expanded upon it. So, um, so we'll have more display cars. Um, we've also introduced trade stands. Um, we've been uh, very, very careful about curating really um, interesting traders and brands that would that would uh, would be of interest to the attendees. So we've got that, um, and then we've also got some brilliant sponsors, um, which include Heritage Parts. Um, and again, it was the same thing. It was all about finding brands that you know shared our ethos, um, that had great products, great customer service. And things that fundamentally would be of interest to our attendees. So we've got them. Um, we've got a, an interview session with um, uh, Dan Fur from GT Porsche, who you, who's, who's a prolific editor, a really nice guy, who's been very supportive on a personal level of, uh, of everything I've done as well. Um, and he'll be doing a Q&A session um, with Autofarm, myself, and importantly, also with all of our sponsors. So with Heritage Pods, so that the attendees can get a, a real feel of of why um, they're sponsoring all cooled and, and their relevance in terms of um, in terms of uh, in terms of classic Porsche ownership and Porsche ownership as a whole, I guess. Cool, cool. Um, so if we talk, let's talk nine six fours just for a second. Your first one, first Porsche was a nine six four. Your second one, so Black Betty was a nine six four. You just finished that gorgeous silver machine in the background, the anniversary. Yeah. Um, is it fair to say the nine six four is your favourite out of all the nine elevens? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the nine six four is an interesting one. Um, Yes, I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's what got me into 911s. Back in the day, they were the 911 that nobody wanted. They suffered from dual mass flywheel issues. Uh, the first year didn't have a head sealing gasket, so they leaked oil. They were also born into a recession, so people didn't buy them. So they kind of fell into disrepair. And at the time, it was the cheapest 911 out there, and it was all that I could afford. So at night, the 964 has got a, to answer your question, has got a, a very sweet spot in my heart, and it will always be a car that... that, that um, the, that I'm uh, that I'm fond of. Um, I guess my favourites are probably the 964 of the air cooled variety, as well as the um, the 1970s uh, long hood cars. So that would be um, uh, that would and long hood. Um, oh, sorry, uh, long wheelbase um, uh, 72s and 73s. The two fours um, also have a real sweet spot with me. The 964 is a quite a special one actually because the the cars before the 964 were all uh, torsion bar. And the cars after the 964, the 993, were all multi-link rear suspension. So actually, the 964 is the only generation of, of 911 to have uh, coil, coilovers or coil suspension. 
um, and a single arm, uh, banana arm trading arms, as I call them. So they have a very unique feel um, that you, uh, you, they have a very unique feel that you don't necessarily get with, um, with uh, the earlier cars or the, the later cars. They're kind of a, um, yeah, they're a special, special one in my heart. Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded answer. <laughs> that's right that's fine um so there's a uh, there's a four-wheel fly amongst the uh, porsche ointment downstairs which is a uh, black 55 beetle uh, yes. down in... what's the, what's the story there so what's the story with this this car is well you know what, what you see here as a whole is is basically a representation of every iteration of of uh, porsche's air cooled evolution um so you've got your you've got your you've got a beetle over here three five sixes you're into long hoods um, with a 69, the earliest long hood I have in the background there, um, which will get restored eventually. And then you finish off with the 993. Um, the 356 for me represented where I started from. It was really about the cow look guys that really captured my imagination. I love what they were doing. Their attitude seemed cool. And the idea of losing weight um, is always a brilliant performance gain. So, so this is kind of harks back to my love affair with, uh, with, uh, with where, where I started. I started with a... Um, with a, what was it, it was a 57 oval window that I hot rodded, that was the first car I ever did. Um, and eventually I sold that car. Um, and then this was a few, I think it was about, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, I wanted to get back into a, into a Volkswagen Beetle. Um, and I didn't want to do a full, a full build because I had other priorities going on. Um, so fundamentally this came over, it had been built by um, some guys in the US um, and they've done a brilliant job, they were well renowned and, uh, and effectively it's a, what you call a resto cow look as it still has quite a bit of chrome on there. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that car. Awesome, and then next to it you've got the 356, so is that, is that staying as it is or have you got some wild plans for that one? Yeah, so this is an Italian restoration, um, so it's not what you would call the best. Um, although I'm <laughs> sure there are some great Italian restorations out there, but this isn't a good one. Um, it was, uh, I found this car in Italy. Um, it effectively, it runs, it drives, it's a good little car, but one day I'll get to it um, when future projects allow. And the plan will be to, to shed some weight um, and really make it a little bit more purposeful. Um, it's a lovely car to drive. Um, yeah, it just it has a real elegancy to the way that it handles. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant car. There's a lot of difference uh, between the 356, especially a late one like this, a 1963 Super 90, and, uh, and the Volkswagen Beetle. And that's what this is about. There's, in terms of my personal journey with air-cooled Porsches, it's, it's seeing those subtle nuances as the air-cooled Porsches evolved. Cool. So what happens when you fill the unit up? Have you, have you got kind of... <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I'm 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 getting pretty close. Um, there are, believe it or not, a few cars which are missing from here. Um, I'm in the process of um, putting together a race car, um, and then I have Black Betty, uh, the car itself, um, which has been a, a six-year project, I think, so far, um, and shows no signs of being ready anytime soon. Um, so, yeah, I'm I am probably going to run out of space at some point or another. But fundamentally, what's important to me is that here there is the flexibility to be able to jump in a car and go. Um, I'm, I'm, I really enjoy driving. That's what it's all about. Um, and if it means that I don't have the space to be able to get the cars out really easily, well, then that's defeatist or it doesn't, um, it doesn't really make sense for me. So I think, uh, if it gets to a point where, uh, where something else, um, wants to come in, I think someone else, something else will have to go. And I do, I do sell cars from time to time. Um, I'm not a dealer. Um, but, uh, from time to time there is, there is a car that will leave, um, this is probably the, one of my most recent acquisitions. I used to have a, um, uh, a Carrera, an RS, which was a, um, which was a car that had seen a lot of track work, um, but, uh, but, but um, mechanically was in really good condition. So I ended up doing a full um, cosmetic restoration on that car. Um, and that car went and, uh, and in, uh, against part exchange against this car. So it allowed me to buy this car, which is a, a 3.8 RSR. Um, and this is a car that, that was restored and put away, uh, cosmetically restored or structurally restored um, in 2008, I think it was. And, but mechanically, it's in quite poor state, so it needs completely overhaul in terms of running gear, engine, and so on. So this will be, this will be my next project for the time being. Yeah. Just picking up on it, we've got someone asked where, where you're based. You're near Oxfordshire, aren't you? Or you're in Oxfordshire. Just yeah. For, uh... Um, yeah, all the information about who we are, what we do, what's going on is at boxinggas.com. 
Um, and we're we're based in uh, we're based uh, yeah in central England. So we're junction nine of the M40. Um, uh, yeah, ideally located where we're now in 30 minutes from over 50 percent of the UK's population. So it makes us really easy um, for people to get to effectively. Cool, guys. So I'll just yeah just pop that one in there. Um, is there a specific car builder you'd love to have kind of build one of your cars or build a car for you, like Singer or Gunther Works or Rod Emery or? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, there are there are so many um, there are so many uh, great shops out there. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, what's called I, I enjoy getting my things dirty, but it's unfortunately time isn't something I always have on my side. Um, although the lockdown has allowed me to finish off um, my anniversary project myself, which has been which has been really nice, and I'm hoping in the future I'll get more time. So I do I do use specialists, um, but I like to project manage my own bills. So. I'll have someone I use for metal work, another person I use for paint work, another one I use for engine work or plating, whatever it may well be. Um, so, but yes, do, do I love their work? Yes, I do love their work, although I like to get involved in my project, so I don't know whether I'd be, I'd be okay with handing over everything over to, uh, to a specialist. I'm a big fan of what Roof do. Um, okay. They're kind of, you know, the, 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 one of the oldest tuners out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I certainly have a huge amount of respect for them. I think Singer do a great, um, yeah, Gunther works. I think it's all brilliant. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, you're big into track days. Uh, what's your favorite circuit? Uh -huh. got... Yeah. Um, so with, with circuit, it's, I actually tend to stick to quite a few circuits. I think if you, for me, I don't get enough time to, 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 to spend enough time on circuit. I don't think anybody does because everybody wants to go on the circuit as much as possible. But, um, so I tend to stick to, to a few tracks to learn them and get my lap times as, as low as possible. So in the UK, my favorite circuit is Donington because I love the elevation changes. Um, it's got everything that you'd need, really. Um, Craner curves are brilliant. Um, and then on the continent, so in Europe, um, it has to be Spa for me. Zandvoort is probably a close second, but um, Spa is just a phenomenal circuit. Um, it's just got everything that you could need. Elevation changes, um, off cambers. Um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. In fact, this year so far, I've got six dates booked. Um, I was planning to do to, to start racing, um, but with the racing calendar kind of being thrown out because of uh, everything that's going on with COVID-19, I think I'm going to be focusing a bit more on track days and, uh, and building the race car for, for maybe next season. I don't know. So, um, so I've got six dates booked, and um, they are Silverstone, Donington, and Spa will be in September. Cool. And what's your, what's your track car of choice? Is that the um, track car of choice is probably this. So this car came about for two reasons. One, it was the, the last of the air cool generations that I hadn't yet acquired. So it was something that I really wanted to get to grips with and understand and, um, and, uh, and go through the process of, of discovering what is possible with these cars when it comes to modifications. Um, and also this car came about because uh, nowadays a lot less air cool guys are tracking their cars. Um, so if you want to play with the modern GT3s, you need something that's got a little bit more power. Um, so this car was pretty much a full build for me. The only thing I haven't touched is the engine. Um, the engine was already done by the, 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 the previous owner. It's a 3.8 twin turbo that was built by Reinhold, who was head engine builder at Roof. Um, and then he went off to start his own shop after building the Yellow Birds engine. Um, and he built the engine in there. So it's a fully forged engine. Um, I think it's running 10.1 compression from memory and just a bar of boost. So it's not, it's not crazy. Um, and, and with, with an overboost facility, this car will develop 600 horsepower and 800 newton meters of torque. So effectively, it really, really keeps you on your toes. And it certainly does a very good job of um, taking care of modern GT3s. GT2s tend to get away. Uh, they have a, a little bit more um, top-end horsepower um, and about 50 newton meters less torque than this. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's, it's, yeah, that's my track car of choice. Um, all the running gear is all motorsports. Um, yeah, rose jointing, four-way adjustable suspension. Uh, we've widened the arches. We're running a 255 and a 295 from memory. Gearbox is rebuilt. Um, yeah, there's a plethora of different things there. <laughs> That's road legal as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is road legal. It is road legal. And you know, the I could have gone all out and stripped out all the carpets. Um, 
and uh, and put a cage in it and I, I could have gone uh, completely crazy but instead I, I i stripped it all out got rid of all the sound deadening we redid the interior all in black leather because originally it was uh it was it was beige which didn't work for me personally got rid of the big hefty seats uh sun visors are gone stereo are gone electric windows are gone uh, rear seats are gone but this car still remains bearable um so the point is is when you wind the suspension all the way down these are the outboard canisters which are here um, when you run the suspension all the way down, it's still drivable on the road. Um, so effectively, you can get me to and from the circuits without having to faff with a trailer. So I've still got that flexibility and usability with this car, which was absolutely key. Um, so yeah, this is a street legal um, track machine, effectively. Yeah. Cool. And is there a particular circuit you've, you're still yet to drive and you kind of think you're sort of itching to get to it? Oh, yeah, always. I mean, you know, th th there are so many circuits out there. Um, yeah, Porto Mayo is, is one I still haven't done. Um, and, uh, I have a, uh, there's a, there's a group of us that, uh, the, there's a group that goes on a regular basis and I still yet to join them and they, uh, they keep reminding me of the fact. So yeah, that's, that's definitely way up on my list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is the, is the blue and white car going to see the track or is that just a, a look thing? No. So this, yes. Okay. So this is a race car. This is a full on FIA HTP 70, um, 73 RSR. Um, this is not one of the 47 cars. Um, this is just an FIA built 73 RSR. So effectively it's built to the regulations, which means it is exactly as it was in period. Um, okay. and this car is, is a car really that, that has a certain value. So it wouldn't necessarily be too responsible to, to track it on a regular basis. It's more something that you would race on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So the value basically, yeah, as much as I don't like talking about values, it's not what it's about. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a full-on FIA car, and it's, it's, really, it's really something that needs to be saved for FIA racing as opposed to um, just mucking about on the track day where you could get a ding with, a, with, a, with another car. Um, yeah. It's also, it's also, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a motorsport engine. Um, you know, with air-cooled engines, your kind of limit for, um, for usability um and for reliability is 100 horsepower per liter you go over that and you're into race engines that need to be stripped down to the end of every season uh this is a three liter engine that develops from memory 320 horsepower um it does 8,000 rpm um so effectively it is a very highly strong race engine um so fundamentally you do really want to save this or i do really want to save this for for racing as opposed to just track days it's it's it would be a bit i don't know this is kind of it would be taking a, um, uh, I don't know, what's the right metaphor? Um, it would be taking the wrong equipment to the circuit, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for attracting. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, uh, yeah, another sort of hypothetical type one. If you were the op offered the opportunity to just pick the box and gas up, but clone it, and then put it down anywhere else on planet Earth, where would you like to build another box and gas? And so it's funny you mentioned that. In an ideal scenario, it would probably end up in California, I think. Um, it's, it's a difficult one because, you know, uh, I don't come from a background of, of, uh, uh, of building buildings. This is a whole new industry for me. So it's been a, a very steep learning curve um, and certainly a, a very daunting experience with a lot of highs and lows. Um, and I'm still learning this trade. I think I'll, I'll be learning it for quite a while. So the, the idea of going abroad um, to a country where I don't speak the language and finding a whole new team of contractors to start building would be incredibly daunting for me i would need a lot of infrastructure behind me that's for sure in order to take on that kind of challenge um so i think in order to make it a little bit easier on myself i think uh, somewhere which is english speaking would probably be 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 easier um but at the same time i think i'm i'm uh, if i'm quite honest there's um there's a lot to be done here with boxing gas over the next three years um, and there's a lot more growth planned in terms of this business uh, before I start thinking about that eventuality. Um, and then there's the prospect, which is that, you know, there is a point at which work-life balance is important. And uh, the lockdown has certainly highlighted to me how important it is to spend time with, uh, how, to, how, how nice it is to be able to spend more time with family, is what I'm trying to say. So um, I don't know whether I have those aspirations quite yet, Andy, but then knowing me and my past track record, I tend to get itchy feet. So there is a quite a possibility that as much as I say this right now, I may end up getting itchy feet and want to try something new later down the line. Oh, yeah, I wasn't expecting you to kind of almost come out with a bit <laughs> for it, but it sounds like it's slightly less crazy than I originally thought. 
Um, yeah, well, you know, yeah, and I'm sorry I've given you a really long answer there, and um, there's probably some glib stuff in there, um, or overly, yeah, but uh, but yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at. Awesome, I think that's kind of that's run run through my questions really, and um, right. Anyway, tell me about you. Are you keeping all right? Everything fine? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good actually. Yeah, I um, yeah, I've tried to take as many opportunities as I could out of the uh, the, the situation we're in. I've done some stuff in the garage, a bit of tinkering with the car. The, car, the car's on furlough just to save a little bit of money, so um, hopefully yeah. get on the road next month and uh, get out. And, and how is the 944 doing, though? All good? Yeah, generally, yeah. It's got, it's got a charging issue. The battery keeps going flat, which is, uh, yeah, slightly miserable. But um, yeah. apart, apart from that, I've, that's probably partially through not a lot of use. But, um, yeah, once I'm in it, it's, uh, yeah, giving me smiles per mile. So, um, you need to get yourself some C-Tech chargers. That's what you need. Yeah. Something along those lines, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah it's. Oh, I, I know the feeling. It's it's certainly been, been you know, it's 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 one of those things, isn't it? We're we're on lockdown, doing our thing, doing our bit, but at the same time, with all this free time, when you're an enthusiast, all you want to do is get out there in the car, especially when the weather's been this good. Um, but you know, I'm I'm will it'll happen. We'll get back to normal. Yeah, I've, got, I've got an old VW Polo as well, which into. Uh, tinker with as well which is i don't keep it at home so i need to go and at some point get that but uh yeah that's for another day yeah vw polo yeah yeah so. nice i had a i had a mark 3 vr6 until very 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 recently um, okay yeah so i'm a volkswagen guy as well right you're preaching to converted um that's why <laughs> i think this that's why i think the the, the heritage part sponsoring all court is just such a such an obvious one a, a load of the guys i know in the porsche community you know they they started with the they started with the they started with the bugs and Corrados and you know Mark One GTIs and this and the other. They just kind of progressed into Porsches. So I think it's an absolute no brainer that um, yeah. When when you said that that it's a tick your box and you want to get invo involved with all cool, it was a real win for me. So I, I have to say thank you very much for uh, believing in what we're doing and, and supporting all cool. It's really great to have you aboard. Yeah, uh, obviously having been up there as well, just to uh, just to walk around it and kind of take the whole thing in. It's mm. quite a uh, the show, especially was just kind of a real sort of thrill for the senses. The cars parked around the lake, just really tranquil. It was a bit like going to the National Trust, but discovering that you've walked into a kind of a car show at the same time. And, yeah, um, yeah, really had yeah the right sort of atmosphere and the fact that people could. I've been to your workshop anyway, but people could just kind of stick their head round the door as if they kind of yeah j just got there and have have a look round your collection and. No one's kind of standing there just going, oh, yeah, you can't look at that. You can't look at that. It was just, yeah, really no, well done. It's all hands on deck, you know. I mean, these, these cars are all about, you know, getting up close and personal with them. And I think w what there are many great shows out there. Um, if there is, you know, a, 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 there is a cool part. There are many, I think, I personally think there are many cool things that, you know that the, the, the we try to to, to to get involved with all cord, but it's great to have to be able to have you know auto farms workshops open um, so people can have a real nose around um, have a chat and meet you know industry professionals mechanics that have been working on the cars for as long as auto farm have because um, it gives them an opportunity to i don't know ask questions and and think about modifications or servicing or this and the other um, having that knowledge base um, during an event is a pretty cool thing. I mean, one of the guys, one of the guys at Water Farm has been there since um, they opened in 1973, and he's been there since 1973. So there are a few of the guys which have been there as long as the shop has been open. Um, and awesome. uh, yeah, it's it's great to to you know to hear their stories and and um, and uh, and get their little their little pearls of, of knowledge um, accumulated over those years and being able to you know have that as an element to all called um i think and i hope is something that attracts um people to come down well, a quick one what's your what's your daily driver because you're not posturing around to the shops in <laughs> yeah so interestingly enough um usually i've been a volkswagen and audi group guy um understandably but recently a, a very good friend of mine um had a had a had a bmw um and i know that's kind of black blasphemy <laughs> in these parts um, I had a BMW M135i, I think it is what it is. I can't remember exactly, but I think yeah, it's an M3 one of yes. And um, he 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 made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. Um, so yeah, that is my daily driver. And you know what? It's, it's a great car. It does everything that it says on the tin. Um, and the thing is, is you know, 
in this kind of weather, um, I'll try and get out in the cars as much as I possibly can. But if it's to sit in traffic or to go to the shops in, well, fundamentally, that's not quality, is it? Um, that's just quantity. And you could be in any old car. So when it comes to journeys like that, a little hatchback is, is exactly what's right for us. And then well, otherwise, we also have a, a daily driver that's uh, an Amrock. Um, and that's, that's, so we're back into the Vox m a group. Um, so hopefully that's gave, gave me some brownie points again. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, that car's great because around Vox and Gas, it means that we can you know, throw a load of stuff in the back of it and, and do all the things that we need to do um, when it comes to uh, operating this place and preparing all called. Fantastic. We, so oil cooled, all still going ahead at the moment? Is, um... Yes. Sorry, good question. You did ask that earlier. Um, yes. So the, the plan is this. Um, fundamentally, we want to deliver on our promise. We promised that we were going to do, uh, our promise was that we were going to do an event on August 22nd and 23rd. Um, and if we have to postpone, um, then we will, because our priority is the, the, the safety of our, our staff, attendees, trade staff sponsors, and everyone that's involved. Um, and in that instance, you're, you would no longer, if we force you to accept the new date, then you would, no longer be ex, you would no longer be sold what you'd bought, is what I'm trying to say. So in that instance, <laughs> attendees who have already bought tickets will have the opportunity, and those that will continue to buy tickets, will have the opportunity to either ask for a full refund, or they'll be able to transfer it over to the new date when it is announced. Um, so effectively, it allows people to have absolute confidence that they can buy a ticket today if they wanted to, um, and know that they've got the flexibility to get a refund or to accept the new date, um, should we have to postpone. But to answer your question, <laughs> a bit in a, in a shorter way, yes, as at the moment, we are going on ahead as planned. Um, we, are, we, are, we are aiming for August 22nd and 23rd, and we will, of course, be as reactive um, will be very reactive if needs be that we have to postpone it. We're in a fortunate position where we own our venue, um, so that, that gives us great flexibility um, if we need to postpone for another date. Um, and also, uh, yeah, if we need to find another date and if we need to, um, and, and the sh in the short term, being able to, to announce when we're going to postpone it. Yeah. Well, yeah, fingers crossed everything kind of yeah, gets back to normal pretty soon and... Uh... You'll, you'll be inundated with uh, the course in, come August. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's again, it, you know, uh, our, our events is, is very much about the attendees. They, they make the event. Um, we're just, you know, it, Boxing Ass as a whole is just a, it's just a platform for uh, great brands, whether it's Water Farm that are based here, uh, attendees that come along to our events, um, all the sponsors that get involved, the trade stands and so on. We are just literally a stage. Um, so effectively, we're, we, we count on, 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 on all of you know, these, these great people believing in, in what we're doing, whether it's attendees or whether it's, um, uh, whether it's our businesses on site. Um, so yeah, and I think that you know, the, the, our first event was, was, was everyone seemed to be happy um, and uh, the feedback that we got was very, very positive. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to doing it again this year. And uh, the more... The more people keep coming, the bigger and better we can make it. The better, the bigger budget we can have, um, and uh, the more attractions we can have. Um, so yeah, so this year we've added we've added more display cars, um, more attractions, which I won't spoil, um, which I won't spoil uh, the surprise for, and also the trade stands. Um, so yeah, so we're very much counting on uh, on people's support um, to make it great. Before we before we wrap up, for those who like things on two wheels, you've got a pretty cool motorbike, haven't you? <laughs> Yeah. So in my in my twenties, I used to live in London. Uh, well, not till that long ago. But when I was in my twenties and I lived in London, I used to bomb around on an old, um, well, an old uh, a '95 uh, Harley Davidson Sportster. Um, and it's an air cooled thing, so maybe I can be forgiven. Um, <laughs> But it, uh, it went through a four-year restoration. Um, it didn't always look like this in my 20s, that's for sure. It looked pretty ragged and horrid. But then uh, we completely stripped it back, took it apart, rebuilt it. Um, and, uh, and there you go. So, yeah, so the, the, I used different guys for different bits in the same way that I do with the Porsches. So the engraving was done by a guy called Tony the Engraver. The engraving? Um, Amazing. Yeah, in Magaluf. Um, the the wheels uh, were done in the UK. Um, the saddle work was done by I think it was Dragon Design. I can't remember that I found on Etsy of all places. 
Um, so yeah, so it was just different people doing different bits and pieces, whether it's the paintwork, brass work, this and the other. And then the final assembly wasn't done by me. That was done by a shop called Fenn and Choppers who also supplied the frame. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately the problem is, is now, now um, <laughs> I don't have the same back as I used to have. And, uh, and I, I certainly can't ride it for very long distances. So I can do about a five minute ride and that's about it. And that's because as you can see here, there's no rear suspension. There's literally just a little spring in the seat. Um, yeah, my back not being the way that it used to be. And, and I've still got, I've got a slip disc actually in my neck, a slightly slip disc. So uh, yeah, it's about a five minute journey and that's it. Um, so it gets relegated to uh, popping to the post office and back, getting a pint of milk and back. Ornamental pretty much. Sorry? Ornamental almost. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I, sold, I sold it. I sold it to a policeman years ago and, um, and, uh, and I regretted it. And I always, I, I said to him, I kept nagging him, if the day comes where you sell that car and you don't call me, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Oh, sell that bike. <laughs> yeah. Don't call me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really upset. So he very kindly eventually gave me a call and said, listen, I'm selling the bike. Life is changing for me. Um, probably his back was giving in too. Um, <laughs> so he said, uh, if you want your old sled back, then, then give me a shout. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so we did a deal and I, I got the bike now. So I don't, I don't ride it very often. It gets out from time to time. Um, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's a five minute journey bike, but, um, but I'm never letting go of that bike ever again. Um, yeah, yeah. I made that mistake already once. So, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's, it's cool we're here. We'll, uh, we'll wrap things up, shall we? Massive uh, thanks for coming on and saying, yeah. Well, Andy, it's always a pleasure. You know, you've always been very supportive of uh, what I've been up to on a personal level and, and with Box and Gas. So, you know, and, and having you aboard uh, for All Court is brilliant. And, and cheers for taking the time uh, to, to, to give me a shout out um, to, to, do this, uh, to do this interview. Um, I hope it hasn't been too boring. And, uh, and the, the, the guys watching have... Uh, I've potentially enjoyed it too. We've got a guy from Kuwait. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. Does anybody want to say any questions? Are there any questions out there they want to ask? I think, um, let's have a, we'll have a quick flick through. Uh, do, 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 do. We, uh, do you still have the 997 Turbo? Do I still have 997 Turbo? I'm afraid that has gone. Um, it, was a car that I, it was a car that I enjoyed, um, but fundamentally I wanted to focus on, on current projects um, and so the, so the car had to go. It was a phenomenal car. I really appreciate, um, I really appreciated how capable the car was. Um, there's nothing a modern 911, uh, and especially a turbo, can't do, whether it's track work, practicality, this and the other. Um, I was incredibly impressed by the rebound settings on the dampers. Um, it tended to glide over the bumps very very easily in the road and then it would just suck itself back down it was a it was an incredible piece of engineering um i had a huge amount of respect for it um but unfortunately it was it was short-lived for me um now do i want to get back into a water cool porsche because i'm assuming that's what that question is potentially about um <laughs> yes of course um it will probably be maybe a, an early cayman um to turn into some kind of hot rod i think it'd be quite fun um yeah. Or what was the other thing? Well, I, a 97.2 RS would be amazing. Uh, maybe if prices come down, then I could justify it. But then again, I enjoy building cars. I, well, I enjoy being project manager, manager when it comes to putting cars together. And um, you certainly wouldn't want to modify a, a, a Gen 2 RS. Um, so maybe a Cayman, just a really, really simple Cayman that I can... I can fettle in my own way and turn into what uh, what an ideal Cayman spec is for me would be more interesting. Yeah. Um, what else have we got in here? Um, Try to cycle two. See if I see anything. Any questions out there? Best car in your opinion in the stable from Pork and Beans? Pork and Beans. That's a good name. Um, <laughs> best car in the stable. Very good question. Okay, so one of the questions I often get asked is whether. Uh, what is my favorite car? Um, and, and so just that. And, um, and the, the temptation is to say something that's low mileage and rare. Um, but the low mileage and rare cars are, are cars you can't enjoy or create memories with and you can't modify. Um, so really they end up being cars that get dusty and end up in a corner. Um, and when the curtains finally close, and I don't want to get too... Uh, too misty-eyed about this, but when the curtains close, all you're left with are your memories, um, and I want them of, of a car that's covered in bugs, that's dirty, 
the way that it's intended. You can see this car's covered in, covered in bugs. Yeah, the car that gets dirty, that gets out there, that you can pile the mileage on without having to worry about uh, values or that you can modify without having to worry about originality. So what kind of, so what is my favorite 911? It's a car that I've uh, modified and created the most memories with, um, with friends, whether it's Alpine tours, track days, um, Sunday high day drives. Um, so it's actually a car called Black Betty, which isn't here um, because it's, uh, it's going through its probably final iteration after many, many different iterations. Um, yeah, because that car I've, I've, I've created the most memories. It's a car I've owned the longest, the car I've driven the most. Um, and when I look at it, it reminds me of all sorts of great adventures um, all over the place. Yeah. So the, the orange hot rod, when I came out, you, you kind of said that's, that's got a fairly special place in your heart, isn't it, that car? Yeah, it does. It's a, it's a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very complete car. All the areas of it are, are very well developed. Um, so there's, there's no stone, there's, there's nothing it's not good at. The brakes are good, the handling is good, the engine is right. Um, this is very much a road car. Um, it's a, it's a four liter MFI, so mechanical fuel injection engine. Um, and, uh, and it develops, it's a stroker, so it's not a big rever or big screamer. Um, it just develops a lot of torque and on the road where you don't, on the road where you don't know what's coming up again and the next bend, you're not necessarily in the right gear all the time. So you can ride the wave of torque in an engine like this. Um, so it's a very usable on the road, uh, kind of car. Um, yeah, but this car, you know, this car, I fettled, I fettled a little bit, you know, I've changed the engine, done a few bits and pieces to the running gear and so on, but it's not a car that I've done vast amount of work on in the same way that, for example, this 993 has. Yeah, so yeah. actually in reality, the 993 is something that's closer to my heart because it's a car that I've got very, very much involved with. Um, it's extensively modified in a way that's, that's completely unreversible. Um, and that touches on another, another subject. Um, there are certain cars I will not modify, uh, and there are other cars that I will. This car had already had the engine done. Um, okay. it, all, it had already had an engine, had the rain gutters deleted. So essentially it was, it gave me um, uh, freedom to, to go to town on it and finish modifying it um, without, any, without, any, without any worries about uh, its originality. Um, this car, on the other hand, is a very rare uh, anniversary edition. They bought, I think, 32 to the UK. Um, and there were 12, there must be, le there are definitely less than that now because I know a few have been written off. There are 12 right-hand drive Polar Silvers uh, UK delivered in the world, and this is one of them. And so it's a very original, a very, well, it's a very rare car. So here I have modified it. However, all the modifications I've done here are fully reversible. Um, whereas over here on the 993, they're not. Um, so this is a car that I've tried to be respectful of. All the original parts are on the shelf. And should someday someone um, be the next custodian of it, um, well, then they'll have the opportunity to put it back to stock if they so choose. Um, so this was an extra interesting exercise in, in modifying with restraint. Whereas something like this one over here, um, this is a 3.6 turbo. It's probably the most original car that I own. And there is absolutely nothing that has been done to this car. And this car gets out from time to time, but certainly it doesn't get the same amount of usage as the modified cars or have the same place in my heart. Awesome. It's just, uh, someone's asked what's the rarest car you've got? Interesting question, yeah. Um, hmm. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I can tell you what, without sitting down with my books and being a bookworm about it, figure <laughs> it out. However, yeah, so the, the anniversary is one of 12, so that's relatively rare, for sure. Um, this is a 3.8 RSR, it's a team-built car. So that's a pretty rare thing as well. Um, 3.6 turbo is pretty rare. It was the only, it's believed to be the only right-hand drive UK delivered God's Red 3.6 turbo in the world. So that's a relatively rare car. And this car is a car that I'm very excited about. Um, it's a 69, um, 69S. Um, it is the, the first year of the long wheelbase for the long hood cars. Um, it is the last year of the two liter engine and it was the UK press car for the time. And as wow. you can see, it looks more like a cheese grater at the moment. There's a load of rust all over the car. And the plan with this is this is gonna be, yeah, you can see there's a load of stuff. There's uh, the plan with this is gonna be a, a very, very sympathetic 
restoration with all original parts. It's a matching numbers car uh, with all original parts. So the, if it was a, a lower value car or a less rare car, I would maybe use Danks panels that often fit better. Um, but, the, but for this car, because it's a rare car, we'll use original Porsche panels and have to backdate them so they work for this car um, because they don't do the Porsche panels for the early, early cars. You have to take them, backdate them, and then use them in. But yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of draft going on in this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, another another question, which was uh, earlier on, I think, when you were t um, talking about your kind of your heritage, someone asked, "Do you speak French?" <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm completely fluent in French. Um, okay. I'm not going to give you a French class right now because um, <laughs> I feel like I'm being put on the spot. But yeah, no, I'm completely fluent in French. Um, yeah, and it's certainly it's certainly um, it's a little bit handy when you're on the continent and you're uh, driving at a respectable speed on on the motorway. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, I, yeah, I, 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 I am fluent in French, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, we said we were going to kind of wrap, wrap it up, and then we sort of ended up with another 20 minutes of chatting, which was just cool. Yeah. Um, so for people who want to kind of follow you and aren't kind of already aware of your, where you're at, you're at Black Betty and Co. on Instagram. At Black Betty on Instagram. At, at Box and Gas. Yeah, at Box and Gas Co. on Instagram, yeah. And then, um, so info on the show, oilcool.com. Oilcool.com gets you all the info for the show. Yeah. Uh, is it boxandgas.com? You've got some cool merch as well, and your t-shirts. Boxandgas.com is, uh, yeah, is, is, the, is, is basically all about Box and Gas as a whole. Um, and yes, we have, we have a range of different merchandise, um, which are all my own designs. Um, they're all high screen prints with uh, embroidery on the front. Uh, screen prints on the on the neck label and we've gone with quite a utilitarian cut so it's a it's not um it's it's a, it's a heavier weight cotton and uh and uh and and more of a more of a box cut more of a traditional and we've got loads of different styles and bits and pieces uh caps and yeah all the usual kind of stuff um yeah have you got the one with the full color print on the back there the yeah that's yeah that's so all... that's so i had a lot of fun designing these but effectively this is one of my more simple designs, uh, just a fook wheel. Um, you've got the Black Betty ones. Um, what else have we got in here? Um, yeah, we've got one with an engine logo. And then I wanted to do something that was a little bit more punk rock, a little bit more extreme. Um, but fundamentally, my skill sets were limited and I couldn't, I couldn't do this one. So I had to, uh, get, had to do a collaboration. Um, and I basically gave him a full brief of what it was I was trying to achieve. Um, so this is much more of a punk rock kind of thing. Um, it's uh, it's the Valiant, uh, the Valiant RSL, um, and then you've got a, uh, a zombie there that's being woken up uh, by the <laughs> megaphone uh, exhaust systems, um, and it's just waking the dead. Um, yeah, this is a bit punk rock. And then so that's listed, that's live, and this is the sweatshirt version, but it also comes as a as a t-shirt. But then we've also got a new design which hasn't gone live yet. And it's kind of the next one in the series. Um, so this is kind of a preview of what we got coming up. And this is Barnstormers. So here the idea was, you know, it was a, a car bursting out, Cukes of Hazard style with the zombies trying to get in. Um, so yeah, so I had a lot of fun designing these, um, coming up with a concept. And then uh, credit to the artist who put it together for me. Um, yeah, so I think that's my, that's my kind of zombie run of, uh, of Porsche merch. <laughs> Um, yeah, you've got the Jägermeister livery there. And then I've got a few more designs up my sleeve, but they're, uh, they're going to be a bit more subdued and, and yeah, yeah. Uh, less extreme. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm done with the uh, afflicting zombies on people. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Frank. I'm going to, um, yeah, we'll wrap it up. Uh, massive thanks for everyone who's been kind of watching, asking questions and all the rest. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Hopefully you're enjoying these kind of little interviews and things we're doing. Um, We'll be saving this chat to stories. A bit of luck technology will let us kind of put it up onto our Instagram TV, onto Facebook as well. Um, yeah, see you all soon. Uh, stay safe. You know where to find Frank now. And um, yeah, thanks again, Frank. It's been an uh, absolute pleasure. Andy, thank you to you. I really appreciate the support. And um, I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing a bit with you when, uh, when everything quiets and down. And hopefully it'll be before all called itself. Yeah, fingers crossed. Take it easy, my friend. Cheers. See you later.